Ryan Inman is a fee-only financial advisor who works exclusively with physicians. How did he end up in this niche? Well, he gets us. His wife is a pediatric pulmonologist, and part of why he understands our struggle so well is that they've been together since the beginning of college. He graduated from the University of San Diego and has two masters, one in business administration and another in accounting and financial management. He manages Physician Wealth Services, which does financial planning for physicians. He even has his own podcast where he answers physician-specific financial questions called the Financial Residency. So if you're looking to take a deeper dive, find him there. He also manages the Physician Finance Facebook group. In this episode, we discuss how to find a financial advisor and make sure that they're working in your best interest. He answers questions like, what is a fiduciary? Who should I buy life and disability insurance from? Is picking stocks and timing the market possible with enough research? What services should a financial advisor provide? And finally, we end with what is the most common financial mistake he sees physician make? Warning, he's a bit of a killjoy here. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Ryan Inman, thanks so much for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So you're a fee-only financial advisor. So today we're going to help people decide how to choose their financial advisor. If they're, they're making their first foray into attending ship, they don't feel comfortable managing their money. They want, they want some expert assistance. And, you know, before the show, we were talking about Dr. Google, right? So our patients will look up their symptoms, try to figure out their diagnosis and think that they can match our expertise given medical school and residency and all their user experience and I find that there are a lot of financial bloggers out there that have this as their side hustle, and they think that they can match a professional financial advisor's input. So today, we're going to take the time to really explain why there's a lot of value in a financial advisor and then how to pick one. So you chose a fee-only model. So there's an assets under management model, which is if I have a million dollars in the bank and they take 1% of it as their annual fee, then I would think, right, they're trying to make me more money because the more money I have, the more money they make, right? But that's not the model that you chose. Why did you chose a fee-only model? Yeah. So let me let me back up real quick. And I joke, by the way, just so you, everyone's clear all the time with my wife of that, I'm going to web MD something and prove her wrong, which never ends up working. But I threaten and it loses every time. But so the the there's a fee only model and a fee based model. And they're the difference, I mean it sounds super similar. Everyone gets it confused. Even when they're trying to recommend a fee only advisor, they say, yeah, work with a fee based advisor. So I think we should probably start there. Fee based advisors, which NAPFA did a study and said basically night over 97% of anyone who calls himself an advisor or a planner is fee-based. And what that means is not only can they charge, like let's say a financial planning fee to to do work, whether it's a one-time fee or an ongoing fee, it doesn't matter, but they can also sell products. And then with products, you're going to earn either commissions or some kind of like, let's say kickback from either whatever you're selling, typically insurance, but also it could be investments. And a lot of the big brokerage houses, so I'm going to say like the Merrill Lynch's, the Morgan Stanley's, Edward Jones's, Raymond James, those guys, they're all fee-based advisors. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that their compensation structure is bad because their compensation structure, the way that they bring home money for their family to eat is essentially selling you products. Some products you need, most products you don't. The investments that they can actually give to you are in, with those big brokerage houses are actually coming from essentially like their headquarters, their head office. So at Merrill Lynch, it's coming from New York. They say, hey, you can, all of our advisors, you can only put your clients into these X number of funds. 
And that's all you have to choose from. You couldn't go off and try to buy individual stocks or do other things. Like they're really kind of handcuffed because from a compliance standpoint, uh, they need to make sure that their 20,000 advisors are doing the right thing. So that's what fee-based advising is. And just because they work for a big brokerage doesn't mean, that, again, that they're bad. It just is a different form. Even if you don't work for a big brokerage house, and I could have started off my own firm and done fee-based planning, which again, because more than 97% of all advisors are fee-based, uh, you can imagine that anyone out there most often are going to be fee-based. They're selling products. And the reason why I chose not to go that route is because I don't want to have any conflicts of interest with my clients. I want them to know that they're coming to me for my experience and my advice, and they should be able to trust that. That's what they're paying me for. Not, hmm, Ryan told me that you know I should buy this disability policy that he's selling me. Is he telling me that because he makes more money? Or is he telling me that because it's the right thing for me? So I wanted to eliminate as many conflicts of interest as I possibly could. And that is really, I mean, where fee-based is. Fee-only is they can actually charge assets under management just like the fee-based people. Or, you know, you can charge a variety of ways. A flat fee way is the way that we charge. But I chose that because it, one, I think allows me to sleep better at night knowing that I'm giving great advice for a fair price. And even though I make less money by not selling products, it allows me to remain a fiduciary as well as allow clients to know that I really don't have any conflicts of interest. Wait, just use the big word, fiduciary. Oh, okay. What is a fiduciary? Uh, it's someone that is legally responsible to act in your best interest. And who wouldn't want that? Like, I'm not going to go to the doctor and let's say like, and I know you're an ENT, but let's say you're just paid by writing prescriptions, which I know there's some out there that are that way. Uh, but let's say that you're the only way you were compensated by is by writing more prescriptions. I go to you, you're likely to give me a prescription because that's the way you're paid. Why would I want to go to someone like that versus someone who can actually assess the situation, look at my labs and everything and go, hmm, maybe if you just exercised and weren't overweight, maybe you don't need this prescription to lower your blood pressure or whatever it is. And so I, I just, I look at it as, you know, this, this fee only fee based thing is, is, is very black and white to me. And, and I want to make sure that I'm on the side of conflict free and not, hmm, is Ryan telling me this because he makes more money? So is it possible to be fee based and be a fiduciary? Yes, it's just a lot more rare. So how, yeah, how would someone even go about doing that? Because if they can't really objectively offer that, well, if they're not able to offer them a variety of products on the market because they're stuck with what's in their firm, how can they really say that they're acting in their client's best interest? Well, I, it's hard when you're at a big brokerage, but let's say you're a small independent shop and you can actually sell insurance from principal and guardian and mass mutual and you're an independent agent. You're not, you, technically you're tied to one, but you sell all. I, I still think you can claim that you're a fiduciary in that in that perspective, but it better be in writing. So similar to like the Hippocratic Oath, I sign a fiduciary oath with every client and it sounds like common sense. Like, oh yeah, just put it in writing, we're good. Most advisors do not put anything in writing like that. But the fiduciary piece is just really important to me. So we do. But that doesn't mean, you know, that if someone was fee-based, they couldn't do that. It's just really rare, to be honest. And then how do you prove that someone is or isn't a fiduciary, right? They sign that piece of paper. Can't they, st how does that restrict them from? You know, I mean, at some point you have to go off. Selling you products that aren't right, right for you or. Yeah, you have to go off some trust. And I mean, if they're not acting like a fiduciary and they put it in writing, like they're legally held to this and you've got it in writing. If they don't act in that, then you obviously have a case to, to kind of build against them if they weren't acting in your best interest. And there was a lot of hype several years ago around advisors being forced to be fiduciaries. I mean, it, this is so bad that in my industry, we're having to create laws to tell people like you need to be good and kind and respectful to other people and be fiduciaries and put their best interest ahead of your own. Unfortunately, that literally was only in retirement accounts. And it was essentially saying like, you can't sell these crap products in someone's IRA, but then you could take your fiduciary hat off and put on the, I am a horrible person hat and go sell them this terrible annuity or whatever it is in basically a non-retirement account. And the entire industry freaked out because 
it would have crushed all of their, their other advisors that were basically selling these products into retirement accounts. It's kind of unfortunate. I think, well, I think when it comes down to it, any industry can't regulate itself, right? I think you always need to have outside regulators. And I, I think so of, of medicine as well. I think the current system doesn't work, but I think, I think that's true in, in any profession that, that we all like to think that we can regulate ourselves. But in reality, you really need some outside perspective to, to keep everybody in line. So, so I really don't, yeah, I don't think that's specific to your field. Yeah. But, but back to the original thing with the assets under management model, right? So there's the AUM model as it's referred, sometimes AUA, assets under advisement. Advisors can charge on that. And what that means, I guess I should say, is that the AUM or assets under management is accounts that we would actually manage from our firm, like at, let's say, TD Ameritrade, where we do, um, where we custody clients' funds. The assets under advisement would be, let's say you have a work sponsor plan, like a 401k, and I'm going to give you recommendations on that and then charge for my recommendations on that. And people, other advisors do that all the time. I mean, some advisors are even charging on 529s, which is ridiculous. If your advisor is charging on 529, that's, that is just a terrible terrible advisor, to be honest. Well, I think in New York State, we have two options for 529s. Do you want to be aggressively invested or not so aggressively invested? I, if I remember correctly, when I set up my son's accounts, um, so if someone's billing me for that, then it better be a pretty small bill. Well, unfortunately, it's not. It's usually that same one or one and a half or 2% that they're charging on wow. top of that. I mean, I've had, we actually have had people come to us and being charged one and a half percent on 150,000 in a 529 and didn't really realize it because they actually build the assets under management, but build for the advisement on top. Now they have to give you a breakdown of invoice of what they've billed but most people don't actually open their mail and look at it or they know, oh, that's just my bill from my advisor and they rip it up or they don't see or sometimes they just stick it in like a, you know, a, their financial planning uh, vaults or software like a Google Drive and most people don't look at it. And that's why the assets under management model, it, one of the reasons I should say, that the industry is so for it and is built around it and it's really rallied around it is because most people don't actually know what they're paying their advisor. And it's because it comes out of your investments and doesn't come out of your actual bank account, which I think is ridiculous. Because you're not seeing the money leave your bank account. You don't have the pain. If, if the money's yeah. coming out of your, your retirement account or your IRA that you're not touching for 25 more years, and you're not really paying attention to it because most people honestly don't, you, you have no idea what you're paying your advisor. And they know that. And that's why they, in our business, assets under management is the sticky business. When you manage money for a client, it's hard for them to move and change advisors and change everything over to do it themselves. And you actually are going to probably make more money because they'll stay longer because they don't realize what you're paying them. Wow. Very tricky. Very tricky. And that this is like the, the real basics. I mean, it gets real complicated real fast when they're selling products that have real, real crazy compensation structures or just really tough to understand whole life, variable life annuities. You start getting into those things and like the compensation structure is through the roof. If you were just sold, let's say a million dollar whole life policy, just make it real easy. Uh, 35 year old female, you're probably, your advisor is probably going to make Twelve to fifteen thousand dollar commission right then and there, and then they're probably going to make let's call it an average of five percent trail. So five percent of the premium you're paying every year is going to that to that advisor or that insurance agent for selling that policy. So what I don't know if you've actually seen or been exposed to it, but most planners will actually try to target residents or new attendings and say, "Hey, we'll give you all the planning for free." They're like, well, great. This is awesome. Well, one, no one does anything for free. But two, the, here comes the pitch for, well, just buy this disability insurance and buy this term uh, policy that we're ultimately going to pitch in a year or two to convert it to whole life. So we make a huge commission on the back end, but they're going to make commissions on the disability insurance, which you likely need, but they're going to make commission probably $2,500 to $3,500 just on that one policy. So of course they'll do the planning quote unquote for free, because they sell you one policy and they make $3,500 and very, very little work, maybe an hour of FaceTime. 
So do you sell life insurance and disability insurance? Not at all. No, no. that's what makes me fee only is I don't earn any kickbacks or commissions or anything from anyone anywhere. I don't, if I give you the, the name of my accountant, who I think is a great guy and loves sending him business, he can't buy me a Starbucks cup of coffee, even though I'm his client, because I sent him a client, he can't even buy me a cup of coffee. It's that black and white. When so we it's talk like we have the star clause, right? In medicine, we have the star clause where you are not allowed to make money off of sending someone to, like if I, if I refer someone to a pulmonologist, I can't make money off of that referral. That's illegal. It's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing with you. Very, yeah, it's very much the same thing with me, except for those fee-based planners that greater than 97% of all planners or advisors are fee-based, right? So when you go to an advisor and they say, hey, I've got this really great accountant or this really cool estate planning attorney, you're going to love them. Well, that estate planning attorney, maybe it's just, hey, they bought me a beer. More than likely, it's like, oh, hey, here's $500 for referring that client over. A finder's fee, right? Finder's yeah. fees occur all the time in all sorts of business models. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to find out. They don't have to be like, Hey, just so you know, I'm referring you to this really great guy. He's going to pay me $500 for this referral. They said that you'd be like, Hmm, wait a second. Like, why are you referring that guy to me? Is it because you make money? Like he's, you've already prearranged this or is he really the best for my needs? And that's the biggest, biggest piece between fee only and fee based is that giant middle part. That's a big ball of conflict of interest. And that's what I want to avoid. So is that what makes someone a fiduciary if they don't have those conflicts? Or can you have those conflicts and still be considered a fiduciary? Oh man, you're getting into some gray areas. Cause like I it personally, in my my opinion, like I don't think you could be a fiduciary to someone and get paid on the back end somehow and not disclose it. But if you fully disclose everything in theory, probably, but I mean, this is this is so far gray. I guess I'm such a nerd. I'm like, I'm black and white. Like you either do this or you don't, but I'm well, sure. Is, Cause there are going to be people out there and they're, they're thinking, well, I've signed this fiduciary with this individual. Like they, they are acting now. I know that they're acting on my behalf. And what you're saying is a very difficult conversation to have. Oh, I need life insurance. I need disability insurance. Can you, can you recommend anyone? then you have to say, do you make any money off of sending me to that person? Like now you're basically saying to your financial advisor, I don't trust you, right? And that's, gonna, that's a very difficult conversation to have. I think you're asking more disclosure, like, hey, how, how, do, how do you benefit from this? And their answer should be, you pay me for my advice and my experience. I benefit by helping you. I don't make any extra money off that. That's, yeah. That should be it. And I hope everyone asks that question. Because we will see the inverse. The more people that ask that question, the more people will switch to fee only because they will lose a lot of business. A lot. Because once most people start asking that question, like, how do I actually pay you? Like, what am I paying you? And how is it calculated? And do you make money from any other sources, like on my behalf? Or is it just coming from me? And the answer should be, the only money I make is coming from you, the client. And if it's not, your advisor's fee-based and they have conflicts of interest. Again, doesn't make them bad people. It just means that their compensation structure is faulty. And I think that's a good point. You say they're not bad people because I, I, I just... No, I, have, I have friends that are fee-based advisors and they won't ever switch because they have a giant book of insurance business that pays them six figures a year. And if they decide to go fee only, they take a $200,000 pay cut. Well, I mean, that... Who would want to do that? But I would also think that these individuals genuinely think that they're doing the right thing for their clients. If oh, totally. they didn't, I, I don't think they'd be able to sleep at night, but at the same time, well, and I'm not tell, saying that they're villains. So you're giving people a lot of credit. Some people well, are like, I've got to eat. I need to put food on the table. How can I make the most money possible? I didn't finish the statement yet. Oh, I interrupted. Al Capone thought he was the good guy of his story, right? He was bringing fun to the masses. It was, you know, clearly to what end, to what, what means did he use to get it there? But he was providing prostitution and alcohol and gambling and entertainment to these 
people that had no other sources of entertainment. He was a good guy. And that's how he slept every night because he was the star of his show. He was the good guy in his story. He wasn't the villain. Nobody's the villain of their story. So, you know, I think these, these people don't genuinely believe that they're doing the wrong thing and they're pulling the wool over their client's eyes. I think they're probably all believing that they're, that they're doing the right thing for them. We, I'm not comparing all, to them to Al Capone, but you, you see sure. what I'm, I'm just kidding. But, you know, we all tell ourselves little white lies about everything as much as we don't think we do, right? I'm, yeah. oh, I can't lose weight. It's so hard for me to lose weight because I'm so busy. I work too many hours. And I, I promise you, someone out there works more than I do and is losing weight. That's just mindset. And in this case, they might be telling themselves, like, I'm doing the right thing. I'm putting food on my family's table. And like, I'm not hurting anyone. They would, they would have needed this disability policy anyway. Of course. I yeah. think that, that is the most important policy that you should buy. But buy it from an independent third party that has no other vested interest other than to help you and to give you the best thing possible and quote it out at many different sources. And that advisor might be able to do that, but then realize that this is the person you're trusting with all of your financial data and that you hope that they're telling you the right thing and doing the right thing. And it's just a lot of gray area that gets introduced. And that's the best case scenario, assuming that they're a good person. Assuming that they're a good person. Yeah. <laughs> Which, um, you know how much negative press my industry gets, right? And they, they say no bad press is, you know, no, pre all press is good press, but I don't know. I just personally, I can't do it. I can't sell products. Like even I could literally make like four or five times more. I can't do it though. I, I love the idea that people are coming to me for my expertise and for my opinion and being able to help them. And I can do that in a conflict free way. You help them get their financial house in order. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So in a similar vein, let's talk about asset management. So now the, the physician has their assets being managed either by someone who's fee based fee only assets under management, but Active management versus passive management. Let's talk about that. Which which do you typically recommend? Like, are you telling people to buy Apple and sell Google and buy 3D stocks because you know they're a radiologist and they're they're seeing all that 3D printing is doing? And or are you telling them buy the whole market? So uh, do you know who Jim Cramer is? And he's on CNBC. And he gives you like advice to buy this hot stock and sell this. Oh yeah. This he's a caricature stock. of a human being. He's like, well, you know, right. Like Absolutely. he's like, he's a radio host that you can see cause he's on TV. Cause he's got Absolutely. all those sounds and everything. Yeah. Yeah. If someone doesn't know who he is, here you go. Sell, sell, sell. Buy, buy, buy. Right. He's like, buy, 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 buy this, sell, 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 sell this. Like it's, it's a game to him, right? It's he's, he's going through and he's producing entertainment. Well, that's active management. <laughs> Basically, he's essentially saying this stock is going to outperform the market as a whole, which is their benchmark. Okay. And he's saying, hey, Apple's going to do these amazing things. It's going to come out with the iPhone 400 because we're probably at that at this point. And it's going to blow everything out of the water and it's going to outperform the market. And we think it's going to do 20%. Right. Whereas the market, you know, we're ballparking, it's going to do 8%. Well, that, that's, that's their belief. They think that one stock or several stocks are going to do better than whatever benchmark they're going to put it against. And typically people think of it as the Dow, which is only 30 stocks, but let's look at it as like maybe even the S&P 500, right? Which is the 500 biggest companies. And they're trying to beat that benchmark. And that's, that's called active management. And there's mutual funds out there that spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on research and staffing and just all sorts of stuff to try to figure out how to beat the market. Some people are really good at it. Think Warren Buffett. Okay. That guy is amazing. How many Warren Buffetts are there in the world? Well, obviously there's one, but there's a few people that are like him, but he's very, very rare. Whereas you have thousands and tens of thousands of these mutual fund companies out there trying to be basically the Warren Buffetts of the world and trying to beat the market. And there is Nobel Prize winning research that shows that they are incorrect. And the longer you go out in time, the more likely the majority of them are going to be wrong. You go, I think the numbers are you go out 10 years and almost nine out of 10 
of those mutual fund companies or 90 out of 100 are not going to beat the market as a whole, their benchmark. If you go out like 15 years, it's like 95% of them aren't going to beat the market. So where do I go? I go on the passive investment management style, which is let's buy the market. Let's own the market as cheap as possible, be as highly diversed as possible, because now instead of owning, let's say those five stocks that we mentioned before or whatever it was, I'm going to own 3,000 or 3,600 stocks. I'm going to own the whole US stock market. So if Apple does really well, great, I own it. If Microsoft does really bad, bummer, I own it. But I'm not concentrated at 8% or 10% of my whole net worth or my whole account. I own maybe 1%. It's all based on market cap. So I'm in that passive camp because I can tell you I'm not smart enough to be in that 5% uh, that is going to beat the market over that 15-year period or it's less than that. I, I'm being kind at this point, but you know I'm not Warren Buffett. And if I was, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and I'd probably be relaxing in Hawaii on the beach and not doing planning if I was a billionaire. So. I don't even know how that's mathematically possible. I would think half would beat the market and half wouldn't beat the market. Because if you have like a random smattering of stocks, some of them are going to be more successful than the market and some of them are going to be less successful. How yeah. is it that only 5% of them end up beating the market? Uh, I mean, it's because all of all the active trading. They're, they're sitting here and they're trying to buy and sell some, I mean, some of those like firms and the, the big quants that they get really close to Nasdaq and they're trading in milliseconds, right? That's their whole algorithm is based on that. There's some, you know, other funds that are, well, we're going to do a more buy and hold approach and, you know, we'll rebalance infrequently, but they're still trying to actively beat it. There's long short funds. There's all sorts of different funds out there that are doing things and they're transacting all the time. And it's just the way that the results lie. And they've done studies on this like crazy. And it, again, it's like Nobel Prize winning research. And it just shows that they can't outperform the market as a whole. Got it. So I guess. Go try to join that 5%. And, and not only are you like hoping that your advisor does it, this one advisor, some most financial planners who aren't part of these big you know, mutual fund companies, they're buying 8, 10, 15, or 20 different people hoping that some of these guys are right. Oh, these guys buy all large cap growth or whatever. Like they're hoping that some of these do it. Well, the more you add to it, well, if one advisor had a 5% chance, what is 15 advisors going to do? Like the, the, the percentage goes down so much. It's crazy. And then you're overpaying because, because they think they're going to beat the market. They're going to charge a ton of money. And that, that is in the form of an expense ratio, which most people have no idea what they're paying in that expense ratio. But that's to keep the lights on at the mutual fund company, but also pay their, their analysts and their portfolio managers and water in the water cooler, pays everything, right? It's all wrapped in. But because they think that they're providing more value, they charge a lot more money. And it's anywhere from one, I think the industry average is like one and a half percent at that point. So if you're paying your advisor 1% to manage your money and you're paying someone else one or one and a half percent to beat the market, you have to, at a real basis, basically make two and a half percent to just break even. And that is mind blowing to me. I guess if, if they were passively just picking stocks and then holding that and you, and you bought say half the market instead of the whole market, then there's a 50% chance that you're going to beat the market and a 50% chance that you wouldn't, but the it, it's the active, it's the active management that really buying at the wrong time and selling at the wrong time because there's no way to predict, right? Which is your whole argument. There's no way to predict when the right time is without insider trading information. It's illegal. There's no way to know when to do that. So the active portion of it is really the self-defeating portion. Yeah. And then how do you decide like when you have new money, right? You work right now, you make money every month. You got to put money in into to the markets every month. You're doing it likely in your retirement account if you're not doing it elsewhere. How do you know when to buy, what to buy, and what to do without trying to time the market? So if you dollar cost average in, which just means you're buying the same amount or close to the same amount every month, how then in your case, if you picked half the stocks out there and you were trying to buy that, like how would you pick, well, I got to pick this one versus that one. And, and keep in mind, like it's $8 or $10 to trade every time. Like that gets really expensive if you're putting thousand bucks in and you've got to buy 
a ton of these, which is why these ETFs came out. And with passive investing, you can buy, let's say the total stock market, 3,600. Let's use Vanguard. Everyone pretty much knows Vanguard. You know, their total stock market, they're charging like 0.04% in an expense ratio. So when I said that the other ones that are trying to beat the market are charging 1.5% and you've got Vanguard at 0.04 or 0.03, that's a ridiculous savings, like 99% cheaper, but you buy that one fund and now you own 3,600. So there's no trading costs of trying to figure it out. And if you're at a custodian, let's say TD Ameritrade that doesn't allow you to trade Vanguard for free, seven bucks. But, or you could just choose like State Street or iShares and those are on the NTF or the no transaction fee list. And then it's free, it's free to trade. So now you're, you're investing in 3,600, you know, stocks and you know, it's free to trade inside it and you're paying 0.04%. It's pretty hard to ignore what the other side's doing when you have to pay that much money for them to do it. So I, I probably should say like really quick, like disclaimer, like I'm not telling you to go buy this. This is like, we're just talking hypothetical, general in nature. Like this is not suitable for everyone to just put all your money into this. I'm not saying that. Just want to make sure like we're very clear. The disclosure will be at the end of the episode. Cool. Or the, uh, not the disclosure, the disclaimer will be at the end of the episode. So full disclosure about my, my background, my financial situation. We actually have some money with a company that has a fee based on assets under management and they are actively trading and we have meetings with them and they were referred to us by a family member who's in the financial industry, right? So seemingly they know that these people do well and have done well, that we have these meetings, they get, we get these quarterly reports, they show us all the research that they're doing. And what you're telling me is, that that is all like why would they why would they do this like why would these people do this for a living if really, really the research shows that that passive investment is the way to go well i mean some people just think that they're part of that 5% or that 3% or whatever that number ends up being that they can beat the market and maybe they can and maybe you picked the the best advisor out there that does all this research and knows what's going on and it happens to be in that 3% that over the next 15 years, they're going to beat the market hand, hands down and you're going to make more money. Great. Like, awesome. You chose correctly. Or we look at it as, do you think you chose in that, let's say 3% or in that 97% that can't beat the market and you were better off not paying all those expensive fees and going to them? Because likely you're probably only getting investment management help. Maybe I'm wrong, but either way, it doesn't matter. And now you've saved that, you can actually turn around and invest more of that money. And you're writing that 97%. You're going to know like, hey, I'm going to beat 95, 97% of the other funds out there for very little effort. It, it's pretty much a no brainer to me in, in terms of that. And I mean, again, much smarter people than myself have written Nobel Prize winning research around it. All right. I've got to let that sink in for a little bit. So yeah, I just know. And I know so many people that do things the way that I do, right? Like, well, how did you find your financial advisor? Well, he's my dad's financial advisor. And he seems like a totally nice guy. And he, he took me out for dinner. And he seems really knowledgeable. And he's been doing really well with my dad's money. So I just realized that everything that just came out of my mouth was extremely sexist, because everyone in that interaction was male. But that aside, I just know so many people that find their and keep their financial advisors that way. And it, it sounds like you're or, saying or the one that, or the one that I hear that whole up. it was good for Dr. Barnes. It was good enough for me. It's exactly. Like, the only qualification that blows my mind. But hey, I mean, he could be or your she could be your a great advisor and be able to help you walk through cash flow and budgeting and other investments and your insurances and your employer benefits and just the behavioral side of money. They could do, be doing all these great things to earn that fee and more. And maybe they're awesome and can pick stocks on top of it. But the likelihood, the probability of that happening is low. 
I would imagine that those 3% or 5% that do beat the market, because your example was Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett doesn't just buy stock. I'm pretty sure he buys stock in a company that he then takes over and actively manages. So he's not actively managing when to, you know, what stocks to buy and, and sell and when. He's actively managing the company in the stock that he bought, or at least, or, or at least, has significant influence in, uh, in, in in things like that. So he's a lot more communication with people in a lot higher powers than any of us listening or talking do, right? I mean, he's he's been around a long time, not calling him old, but he is old, and and he and he knows the ways, and he he moves billions of dollars around to acquire companies that he thinks he can add value to in some way, shape, or form that he can add value to those or that have a significant moat around them. Coca-Cola. Everyone knows what a, you know, a, a soda is, a Coke is. Most people call it Coke, even if they're drinking Pepsi, it's kind of ridiculous, right? So he invests in high quality companies like that, that either have that value or he can provide that value. None of us are putting a billion dollars into anything and we're, we're investing 500 or 1,000 or $2,000 at a time. It's very, very different. So you mentioned that there are other services that a, a financial advisor should be providing or can be providing. Right? That one company, they, you know, they've, they've advised us on matters, but we really don't come to them with, you know, I, I, you know we, my wife and I make most of the financial or make all the financial decisions. They just happen to have a, a bit of our money that they're managing. Okay. So what else should we be asking them or what, or put another way, what else would a financial advisor provide? What other services? Yeah. Well, one, I mean, just to recap on this, you should know what you're paying them. I'm not saying you, I'm just saying anyone listening. You should know what you pay your advisor and be able to look at it and go, am I getting the value out of this relationship? Yes or no. Your advisor should be looking at your whole financial picture, like very holistically. I mean, literally all the way down to like your car insurance. Have they looked and analyzed are you protecting your income completely through disability, through term insurance? If they're selling you whole life insurance, you need to just part with that advisor, go find someone else because they're taking you to the cleaners. That type of policy is like good for 2% or less of the population, yet it's sold to the other 98% who shouldn't be buying it, unfortunately. But we, you should be looking at, like I said, your employer benefits. They should be able to tell you like, hey, this is how much is, you know, is in your 401k. This is how you should be managing the 401k. But also like, what are your other benefits? Oh, you have long-term disability, you have short-term disability. Like, hey, you should be taking some of the term coverage because it's a half a million bucks and it only costs you $4 a paycheck. Hey, make sure you're taking the legal services because you should be getting estate planning done you don't know what that is? Oh, well, how about this? Come in and we'll act as like a paraplanner or paralegal. And we're going to ask you all the questions you need to know in order to go and make the best decision and optimize your time with a true estate planning attorney and having that discussion with you. You should be understanding all of your insurances and honestly not being sold by that person, what the insurances are, but they should be doing a full review of everything, making sure that you have it, making sure you have umbrella coverage. Is your car insurance adequate and up to speed? Most residents, they're just trying to get by and it's survival, totally get it. My wife and I were there. It's literally survival. But when you finish and you're now making like what you really should be worth, honestly, you most times forget to actually increase your auto coverage. And if you got umbrella, they're going to force you to get something, but usually it's not enough. Are you doing cash flow planning? The first five, maybe 10 years out of your training, investment returns don't matter as much. And I'm going to say that because you don't have a lot of money to invest. So make sure that you understand where your money's going. How is it coming in and how is it going out? And I did a show called The Dreaded B Word, and that's for budgeting. And most people don't like budgeting. I think traditional budgeting just doesn't account for like life's goals and what you're trying to accomplish. But you need to know from let's say a cash flow planning standpoint, which is like today looking forward, what do you think you're going to spend? Like you need to know those things and your advisor should be right there helping you. We do monthly cash flow reporting. Like literally every month we send clients a report that we've hand built that says, here's what you thought you, we thought you would spend. Here's what you actually spent and here's what you saved. And did you save enough? Yes or no? Yes. Cool. We already know where we're putting it. No. 
How would you make some changes next month to make sure you get back on track? If you're not having those conversations with your advisor, something's wrong. They're not really advising you. They're just a money manager pretending to be an advisor. How does one go about finding? Is there like a list of all of you guys somewhere? Is there there a club you all hang out at where we can meet you? Like how how do we, because you're really, you're, you're, Industry is very based on sales, right? Like that's that's what you were getting at Almost earlier. Really. And is that like the entire financial industry is based on selling the concept that this is all very opaque and they can actively manage your money better than the market. So they're selling that concept. They're selling um, a but, black box to you saying, I'm smarter than you in this, which by the way is totally fine. You're in you're an expert, you know, you're you're an ENT doc, right? You're you're an expert in your field. You're not supposed to be an expert in mine, but my industry throws it in your face and says, you don't know what we do. We're not going to tell you what we do, but we're going to charge you a bunch of money just to do this one little thing. That's how it comes down, honestly. But you've been doing an excellent job selling why fee only is the way to go. So how, how do I find someone? It's tough. I mean, it, it really is tough. Right? <laughs> that's, that's not the type of answer. I was, looking, I was looking for like a website or something. Right? I mean, generally, we we all have websites, right? But you, you've got to look at it as you know, there's a hundred thousand planners out there, and less than three percent. So there's less than three thousand planners out there that are fee only, and then out of those, most of them specialize in something. Right. Like I only work with physicians. I don't work with dentists or attorneys or anything. Like I only work with physicians and I happen to be married to one. That's what I do. If I, if, if you were an attorney that came to me, I go find uh, you a referral through maybe a, uh, you know, just a connection or a community or something that maybe I have like the, the FPA, um, NAPFA, XY Planning Network. There's a couple like big networks that we can all belong and, and become members of, but those are, Still not, I mean, those are great places to start, but then once you find a fee only person, like find someone that deals in your situation all day, every day. I don't want to go to an ENT doc when my stomach hurts. Like that's not the right thing. So like, why would I go to a planner who specializes in working with everybody when there's someone out there that as an attorney, I want to go to the person who knows in and out what I do all day, every day and sees my situation for 10 hours a day. And uh, just so our listeners know, if you do type into Google, fee only financial planner for physicians, the top listing is the white coat investor who is an emergency department physician and not a financial advisor. The third one is Ryan Inman, the gentleman we're speaking to right now. So if you are going to use Google to find your fee only financial advisor, uh, you'll end up with this guy right here. So it seems like Google for this particular question is spot on. Yeah, I mean, they, they know what people search for, they know what people need, and when you put something in, hopefully you're getting a good result. So uh, <laughs> happy to know I come up in that, but uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I would go to someone who literally specializes in what you do all day, every day. And to find someone, like I, I feel like um, sometimes like I'm a unicorn because I'm not targeting physicians because I think they're wealthy. Honestly, they're not. Most of them are income statement rich and balance sheet poor. And that's why I've advised on like four times as much student debt as I have in, in managed in money that I manage. It just happens that way. You know, in, in back to the advisor of what they should be doing, they should know a whole lot more about student debt than you do. Even though you took out the loans, you know, all the paperwork, like they should know the ins and outs of all the repayment options and all the things that go with student debt. And and we had a, a couple shows ago was with the physician philosopher, and uh, one of the things that he goes into is the diff- we we just touched the surface of the different repayment system and the for and that's that's very complicated. It's very opaque. So and that's you know pay, repayment of debt for physicians is such a huge issue. So if your financial advisor doesn't know about the ins and outs of repayment options for physician loans, and then they, either they learn about it or you find someone who does. Yeah. I'm, we're actually teaching them. One of my side projects is a company called Loan Buddy and it's software actually that's targeted for advisors and it allows them to understand and analyze their client's student debt without really having to be a nerd at it. And so it allows them to get all the information they need, plug it into my software 
and then do it. And I think we're at, I don't know, close to $200 million of debt analyzed on that platform already. So I, I'm, I'm helping advisors learn how to do this. Like it's that big of a problem. I hate student debt. I hate how hard it is. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's very frustrating. Our average client is almost 300,000 in debt. I don't care what the AMA puts out at 180,000. It's wrong. Like everyone that we see is our average is, is literally, it's like 298. It's, it's a lot of money and it's, it's frustrating. And I see people delaying getting married, uh, delaying having kids there's a, they, they feel horrible that they're walking around with this amount of debt. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's frustrating. Like we were there. We were fortunate that my wife was able to essentially live at home, have in-state tuition, did all the right stuff. And, you know, we were able to, to squash her debt really fast, but you know, we had a lot going for us. Uh, she had tons of scholarships for undergrad. Um, again, she lived at home. She took out the least amount of loans possible. Like we were fortunate that, you know, when she finished, it was just under 180,000 in total, but not everyone's that lucky. And it's just, you did what I tried to do in medical school, which is I tried to marry a doctor. That's why I went to medical school. It just, that's funny. Didn't work out for me. My wife and I actually met when we were 18, like freshman year of college. So I got in really early before she (laughs) did anything better. You're like, man, I'm, I'm going to be married to a doctor. And then, then the debt hit you. (laughs) <laughs> then no, you find out what it really what it really means. It's funny when when we were dating in college, like her her dad was pushing her to be a doctor. My wife's extremely smart, like perfect score on SAT and ACT. Like she's brilliant. I'm totally cool saying it publicly, privately, whatever. Like she's way smarter than I am. But because dad wanted her to become a doctor, she was really pushing back. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, I think I'm going to become a doctor. I was like, oh, it's about time. Okay. She goes, don't worry. It's just four years of med school and three years of residency. I'm like, wait, is, that sounds like a lot. It sounds like a lot, honey. Like, are you sure you want to do that? And she goes, yeah, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, all right, I support you. And, uh, and then it was, you know, as residency is starting to, to wind down, it's like, by the way, I kind of want to do three more years of pediatric pulmonary, like that fellowship. And I'm like, okay. Let's do it. So this is like, never going to end. I'm like, yeah. I mean, sometimes it felt that way, but uh, you know, that's why when when he came out, I mean, she only took out like 120 something thousand, but you know, making those income driven repayments where it's based on your actual income and poverty line and family size and all that. You know, we weren't even covering the interest on it, so interest accrued, and it was about 180, about almost 180 thousand dollars when it was all said and done. And we opted to not go for public service loan forgiveness and to just pay it down. But some options for people are public service loan forgiveness is the best. And some like us, it wasn't. So we refinanced and paid it off. So we're running short on time right now. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity to give just one piece of advice. I mean, this has been chock full of great, great information and great advice. But when you take physicians on as clients, either they've never had a financial advisor before, or they've had a financial advisor that's been giving them advice that you wouldn't agree with. What's just one common mistake that you see that you, that you want all physicians to be aware of? Lifestyle inflation. Seriously. Like you delay gratification. We were there. I totally get it. Like you're putting all these things off. You don't make a ton of money. You finally are out. You're finally making great money. And you're like, well, I deserve this. And you go buy the Tesla and the big house. And you might forget that you have student debt that's coming due and you're, you're, you know, you're off the income driven repayment plan. And maybe you need to, whether you're still going to be on the standard plan and going for PSLF or uh, you refinance, whatever it is, like that payment's coming due. You will have to calculate that out into your spending but most of the time it's, well, I've been waiting. I now need a new car because I've been driving the same car for 12 years and it barely works. And it's a safety concern. Well, it makes sense. But you don't need necessarily the Tesla or the new doctor $1.25 million home, whatever it is. Get a starter home. You deserve it. I agree. But don't let your lifestyle inflate like crazy. And I look at it as give yourself a 50% raise. And if everyone just gave them a 50% raise, which by the way, anyone in the corporate world would freak out if they got a 50% raise. But if you just gave yourself a 50% raise and then you actually saved the rest, whether that was to pay down debt aggressively or to actually increase your savings or 401ks and IRAs and taxable accounts, whatever it may be in your situation or paying off consumer debt because you 
racked up some credit card debt while going around for interviews at the end. Like if you can do that, you will be on your way to, to financial success. Unfortunately, I see a lot of the opposite. Where were you when I finished residency? My two, two of my best friends, both orthopedic surgeons, both convinced me to give up my Trans Am, which I loved. Yes, I was driving a Trans Am. Awesome. And get a, an Infinity Coupe, which was totally not my style. And the worst part about it was I, I was living in Manhattan, commuting to Long Island. And for you live in San Diego, so I, it's not the same. I get it. But there is surfing on Long Island. And I couldn't. There are no surf racks for an Infinity Coupe. That was the worst part about it. And yes, I was spending a lot more money on a car that I than I needed to. Well, and then I had to buy parking for it in living in Manhattan. So I needed you. I needed you, Ryan. I needed you, and you weren't there. I'm so sorry. Well, I'm here now. I'm here you to are. help. I'm here to help, my friend. And I appreciate that. Well, listen, this has been extremely informative, and you know, for all those people that have someone else managing their money right now, even if they're trying to do it themselves. This is, you asked a lot of, a lot of excellent questions and it sounds like even one meeting with a financial advisor like you would be extraordinarily informative and probably a huge wake up call for, for the physicians out there. So really I appreciate you taking the time and letting us know, all know what we should be doing with our first phone call tomorrow. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This interview should not be considered personalized financial advice, and we will not be held liable for the use of any information contained within this interview. It is your responsibility to verify anything you've heard using other trusted and reputable resources.